So first of all, please everybody take a nice deep breath. And um, I'm going to ask you to, well, you can try, but I'm going to ask, John may be able to help us, John Downey might be able to help us, is I want you to switch your brains from whatever side they've been on to the other side. <laughs> um, uh, I'd, I'd like to talk about, for a few minutes, about a, a very interesting story that I've had a, the, the pleasure to be involved with over the last 30 years. And uh, it is, without a doubt, the, I think, one of the most exciting and one of the most interesting stories in all of medicine. And is that color going to get a little better? Uh, yeah. And it is one of the most interesting and exciting stories in all of medicine. And um, I've had the luxury of having a first, uh, you know, sort of a front row seat in this process. And I'd like to share with you. Uh, I think what the story is all about, and also maybe to caution all of us to be a little bit more uh, patient with uh, biological and scientific research, because sometimes we have this insatiable appetite for information, and we want things to happen tomorrow, and science doesn't always work that way. But um, just to put this in the perspective of this organization, since I know that this is a business group and it's innovative. And to give you an idea of why I think that this is a very important area, if we look at, if we look at the estimated markets associated with this entity, angiogenesis. Oh, by the way, angiogenesis, just as a brief uh, uh, definition, is the, is the physiologic and pathophysiologic process of the development of new blood vessels. Not blood cells, blood vessels. And I'm sure that, except for Alf Bingham and a couple of people in this room, probably nobody knows what angiogenesis is. But to put it in perspective, at the beginning of this decade, the markets estimated associated with this entity of this process was zero. And by the end of this decade, four years from now, and from, a, from a constellation of different sources, the estimated market is projected to be around 63 billion, almost 20% of the entire pharmaceutical market. So it's not just me who thinks that this is a hot thing. This is a very, very exciting area. Uh, but from my perspective, and why I've been so interested and involved with this whole process, is that if you look at all the things that produce blindness in the United States, and we look at them by age, we see that in infants and children, the most common cause is retinopathy of prematurity. In, in young people and adults under the age of 65, it's diabetes. And in people over the age of 65, it's macular degeneration. All of these involve one area of the, of the anatomy, and that is the, uh, the retina. That, is, that, is that fuzzy to you all? Is that, is that clear? Yeah, because I mean, these are pretty sharp images. And I think I need an eye doctor, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know what it looks like out there, but anyway, this is, this is the back of the human eye. This is a normal human eye. This is the optic nerve, the second cranial nerve, which carries all the impulses back to the brain. Uh, these are the blood vessels that supply the retina. And this area is very, very important. This area is called the macula. the most specific part, of the area where there's a higher concentration of, of uh, neuroreceptors, where if that area is affected effectively, you don't have uh, functional, useful vision. And the way, the way vision really works is that light is projected through the eye and focused from the cornea and the lens onto the back of the eye. And this, uh, this retina acts as this biological transducer, which converts these signals back to the brain, and we see it as sight. Very, very simplistic, very simplistic idea. Now, I said that all of these problems that we're talking about in this country involve the retina. But if we look at vision and blindness worldwide, it really doesn't involve the retina. It doesn't involve the back of the eye. For the most part, it involves the front of the eye. Uh, their infections, their... Uh, uh, they're nutritional, they're traumatic, they're all kinds of other things which really affect why people go blind all over the world. We have solved those problems in the industrialized world. And for the most part, the people in the third world don't live long enough uh, to get the kinds of things that we get. And their infants that are born at 33 weeks don't survive. So what are our problems and how, how does angiogenesis relate to those? Well, retinopathy of prematurity, I don't know if many of you understand or know what, what this is, if you've had a premature baby, you may have some insight into this, but it's a very significant problem and probably it relates, the onset of this disease for, in large part relates to the development of neonatology going back about 50 years, our ability to keep younger and younger and smaller and smaller babies alive. And it's a significant problem. And babies born between two and three pounds uh, have as much as a 73% chance of having retinopathy of prematurity. Or by gestational age, if you look at it that way, 
If a baby is born seven weeks early, it's got a 50% chance of having retinopathy of prematurity. Well, what is retinopathy of prematurity? It turns out that the retina continues to develop throughout the 40 or so weeks of gestation. And actually, it even goes beyond the 40 weeks of gestation, so that the retina actually continues from the optic nerve, continues to grow all the way out to the periphery. Now, when somebody is born at 30 weeks, at 1,500 grams, there's a tremendous shock to the system. A variety of things happen, but for, but for a variety of reasons, that toxic process leads to the cessation of these blood vessels. They just stop growing. And a very, a very interesting thing pheno phenomenon happens. That, that junction between the vascularized and non-vascularized retina, these abnormal blood vessels start to develop, okay? We don't know why, they, we didn't know why they developed, but this process starts to become a proliferative process which is called angiogenesis, totally abnormal. Very, very important problem because as this progresses, these vessels proliferate, cause detachments, hemorrhages, and blindness. In diabetes, huge problem. Estimated that 7% of the population of this country has diabetes. And that, if you listen to the news media and read anything, you realize that that incidence is going up because of childhood obesity. But, you know, we have close to a million people who are blind from diabetes in our society. What's happening in diabetes? Well, as a result of chronic hyperglycemia, patients essentially develop abnormalities. These are lousy pictures. I mean, can anybody just, is there any way we can just spruce them up a little bit? Because what you see in this case, what you can't see in this case, is that there are <laughs> lots of little microvascular changes with hemorrhages and extrudates so that the entire retina starts to undergo a process of lack of circulation. And that process leads again to the formation, you can't see that, leads again to the formation of abnormal blood vessels, hemorrhaging, and detachments. Terrible situation. From an epidemiologic point of view, the largest population is this population that's developing age-related macular degeneration. And these numbers are staggering. One in three people over the age of 75 have macular degeneration. We're talking about two million new cases a year, 200,000 people a year going blind from this disease. And for the most part, we have virtually nothing we can do for them. And again, in this case, the same kind of thing happens. Here, there's a kind of a degenerative process that develops in the vast majority of these patients uh, who have just this dry form. But about 15% of all these people will develop hemorrhaging, which is now called the wet form. And so again, all of these three entities have these two very important common denominators. They all involve the retina, and they all involve abnormal blood vessels. In this case, the blood vessels are developing right in the macula area. Well, what is angiogenesis? I said that it's a normal process. It is. It's a normal process that's fundamental to uh, healing and reproduction. And in the, in the fetus, it's the process of developing blood vessels called vasculogenesis. But when blood vessels are formed from a pre-existing blood vessels, they're called angiogenesis. And you know, this, this we, all, we all understood that essentially vasculogenesis took place in the fetus and that angiogenesis took place only when you were recovering from an injury, if there was wound healing, if there was pregnancy or menstruation. Other than that, our assumption was that people weren't making blood vessels. Adults didn't remake blood vessels and that was not what was going on. But in my field, in my professional career, this process has dominated the, the three main reasons why people go blind. So angiogenesis was an extraordinarily important factor. And we really didn't understand it. And we were probably the only people who were looking at it because it wasn't that obvious in a lot of the other fields at the time. And our working, our working assumption was that some toxic process was producing this. A lack of oxygen was doing this. And so the rationale was to treat and to destroy I don't know if you can see this, but to destroy those areas that were unaffected, the areas that are affected, like in diabetes, and that hopefully we can get that factor to go away. Well, in fact, it was very, very effective. And we now see that if you do that, you can get those blood vessels to go away. But we never knew what that factor X was. And it works for diabetes, it works for retinopathy of prematurity, but this huge problem of, of age-related macular degeneration, because the problem is occurring right in the macula, if you destroy the macula, the treatment is worse than the disease, okay? So if somebody wakes up and their vision is fuzzy and you treat their macula, they're blind. So we really have had no effective treatment for this. 
A slight digression. In 1989, a team of researchers at Genentech, headed up by Napoleon Ferrara, uh, cloned, and, uh, cloned protein that they, they called vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. Uh, and it turns out that VEGF is our factor X. This is really, truly the, the main protein that is responsible for the development of these abnormal blood vessels. And this is an extraordinary discovery. And it's an extraordinary in and of itself that has led to an enormous amount of other activities. But one of the reasons it's so important is because 20 years prior to that discovery by Genentech, Judah Folkman up at Harvard uh, hypothesized that tumor growth was angiogenesis dependent. Now, he was met with a lot of skepticism, as he has throughout his entire career, but he was absolutely right and has gone on to postulate that all of us, through some oncogenic process, have multiple cancer cells all over our bodies, all the time, and that these are probably kept in check by a variety of different reasons, but that probably about one in 600 of these cancers switch their angiogenic phenotype, their ability to actually make VEGF, and that when that happens, tumors grow. Well, this is in fact the case. This is now the case. We know that VEGF, this protein, this angiogenic protein, is really one of the most significant reasons for why cancers develop. So the simplistic thing would be, well, let's inhibit that and we will in fact cure cancer. And Folkman was able to do that in mice. And in 1998 published this article where he actually demonstrated that he could actually get these blood vessels to go away picked up by the mainstream media, May 3rd edition of the New York Times front page. Gina Colada talked about these two drugs which are going to eradicate tumors in mice. James Watson, the Nobel Prize winner, was quoted in that article saying that we've found a discovery that is going to cure cancer in two years. Well, obviously, it's not that simple. Because basically, nature is not that simple. And as, as much as our politicians would like us to believe that, you know, things are very simplistic, that you know, the world is like dominoes, that one thing leads to the next thing leads to the next thing. Well, in nature and science, it's really quite the opposite. A reaction in medicine is sort of like a drop falling in a pond with not one thing leading to another, but a drop leading in thousands of different directions at one time, but more like a pond with a rainstorm, with drops falling all over the place, with numerous reactions going in other directions and intersections, et cetera, making things very, very complex. And even though if we believe this principle, which is in fact true, we find that there are so many unique differences in species and even within a species, so many genetic variations. So it's much more complicated than we ever thought. And this is a very important slide because, as I told you, we thought that angiogenesis in the adult didn't happen. Well, as a result of numerous studies, we now realize that angiogenesis is going on all the time and that we can't just stop it. We thought that, okay, if you have a brain tumor, if we inject you with this protein on a regular basis, you can live with a brain tumor like you would live with AIDS. We'll just control it and you just live with it. It won't go anywhere. The trouble is, is that if you suppress angiogenesis, you'd get Alzheimer's disease or you'll get strokes or you'll get infertility or other problems. As, as, as the opposite is if you increase it, blindness, cancer, and other kinds of things. And so the caution of this is, in our insatiable appetite for this kind of information, is that this is always much more complicated than you think. And it only, we only find out how complicated it is when you actually start doing these experiments and realizing that it's far more difficult than you thought. I'll finish up with just a very interesting and important thing. We said that up until recently we had nothing for macular degeneration. Well, in fact, now, as of this past year, we have several synthetic aptamers and um, antibodies for VEGF that we now can inject directly into the eye when patients develop this problem, okay? Patients, for all intents and purposes, would go blind. If they'd wake up and they'd notice that their vision was a little blurred in one eye and they had this little tuft of blood vessels under the macula, the inevitability was that this was gonna go on and uh, blind them. Well, what we do now is we can inject one of these proteins directly into the eye. One of these was just approved this past summer, Lucentis, so that we can bind that protein and instead of this happening, the eye stays the same. And the results are extraordinary. And the two, years, the two year results are that after two years, Lucentis, the treated group, uh, had 90% maintenance of their vision as opposed to less than, less than almost half the patients who didn't have that. 
and 40% of those patients maintain good vision as opposed to 11% of the control. So for the first time, we now have something that is effective in macular degeneration, the wet form, which affects countless numbers of people. But the caution is, we're not sure it's going to work forever. It works right now. We don't know whether that effect will deteriorate, whether the effect is going to last for a year, two years, three years. Right now, it's very promising. And worldwide, this activity is, is phenomenal. There are 27 endogenous angiogenesis inhibitors that have been identified. 28 countries, including the United States, have now uh, approved them for studies. And so now you can see why I'm so excited about this area and why all of us are going to know a whole lot more about this uh, entity at some point in our lives because it's going to affect everything. It's going to affect cardiology, fertility, dermatology, ophthalmology, and certainly oncology. So I just wanted to let you in on this little story. So thank you.